Good morning. It is a privilege and an honor to bring your message this morning. I'm very thankful and honored and privileged. This has been a daunting week for me, so I covet your prayers. And so it's with great privilege and satisfaction that I bring the word of the Lord to you today. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And we will be reading, starting at verse 21, and then going down to 25, and focusing primarily on verse 24. I was talking with a fellow elder this past week, and he had joked with me, he says, Brendan, you preach high and tight. Uh, joking with baseball metaphor, and it's not my intention to do so. By all means, I, I have within my soul uh, the same saying as Richard Baxter says, a dying man preaching to dying men. You never know when you put your head on your pillow, a preacher looks up and sees Jesus the next day. And the thought passes through your mind, this could be the last time I get to preach. So that's why I preach the way I do. Verse 21 says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I'd like to speak to you this morning on the topic of he went before us. Every time I, you know, when I look at a lesson, I feel like the title of, of the sermon should always be why Jesus Christ is my hero. Uh, that's, that's what, every, no matter if I preach out of the Old Testament or the New Testament, I feel like that ought to be the title. Why Jesus Christ is my hero. The lesson we have before us shows a very daunting statement that we find from the gospel writer Matthew. And when we kind of look at what Matthew sets before us, we see that Matthew is a gospel writer who focuses solely on the kingdom. He is a kingdom writer. He focuses on the Messiah, the coming kingdom that will come and the king that would inaugurate it. So when I look at the Gospel of Matthew, you really see it focus and separate into three different sections, primarily on the Messiah has come, the Messiah and his messages, and the Messiah and his masterpiece. And where we find our lesson today comes in a juncture or an intersection between the last two sections, the Messiah and his messages, and the Messiah and his masterpiece, his work at Calvary. In our text this morning, from the Gospel of Matthew, is sandwiched between two significant events. When you look at Matthew chapter 16, 
we see that there is a monumental event on one side where we see the confession of Peter in verse 13. He says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? We'll get there in a minute as we walk through the text as we lit up to the verse that we're at. On the other hand, we have the transfiguration. So on one hand, we have Peter's confession. On the other, other side of our lesson, we have the transfiguration where Jesus is now unveiling his deity so that Peter, James, and John is able to view who he is. So we have the confession and then the unveiling on one side and the other. In between here, we find our Lord and the disciples have traveled to Caesarea Philippi. So geographically what this looks like, we have Caesarea Maritima down by the coast where Herod was reigning. And then we have towards the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, Caesarea Philippi. And it's in this region where we find ourselves in the text this morning. It says in verse 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And what is happening, Jesus now setting the tone by which he will use as an intersection to begin informing and communicating to disciples what must happen to him. He says to them, but who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven, he revealed this to you. And Peter, and it's it's quite interesting, when we look at the, the three different pieces of text that we will be talking about this morning, we see Peter showing up in all of them. We see Peter showed up here as the, from the confession, speaking on behalf of the people. And then we see Peter getting rebuked. We'll talk about that. And then we see Peter, of course, speaking up to the transfiguration. But in the text where we have right now, it says, to, and I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And right here, we find that Matthew is going to make a distinction. He's going to show that there is going to be a change in mindset, a change in mindset that is critical. The gospel writer Matthew portrays Jesus beginning to shift the mindset of his disciples from just merely a physical kingdom, a kingdom not just just built on brick and mortar, but one that we built on a beautiful work of Calvary's Hill and his resurrection from the dead. And so what we have here, the understanding, the mindset that we have in the disciples is that we find that they they were looking, they were looking for the Messiah and they found Jesus Christ. And he began to say who he was. They believed him. We see Peter's confession. You are the Father's Christ. You are God's Christ. But the mindset that they had was incomplete. The mindset that they had was Jesus Christ was going to set up his authority kingdom right now. And you can't blame them, the disciples for this thinking. The disciples expected and were waiting for Jesus to establish his reign Right now, in Mark chapter 10, we see that uh, there's, there's a scene where Jesus is getting ready to go through Jerusalem, and the mindset of the disciples at this time was even that, that they were so focused on what was going to happen in the kingdom that even after Jesus begins to talk to them about what was going to happen to him, how he was going to have to suffer at the hands of the Pharisees and the scribes, and then he will be crucified, and three days later, he will rise again. Even after this, we see James and John talking to them about the seating arrangements that would happen when he comes into his glory. 
And so the mindset of the apostles during this time was primarily kingdom focused and the kingdom will be right now. They were ready for Jesus to step right in. And so when Jesus flips the switch in verse 21 of our, our chapter 16, that was hard for them to reconcile. And you can't blame the disciples. They were right, but incomplete. Perhaps when they thought about Jesus just as king, they remembered and held on to Isaiah 42.1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Perhaps the disciples remembered and held on to Jeremiah 23.5. Behold, the days are coming, said the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness on the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Perhaps the disciples held on to, they held on to Daniel. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the ancients of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So if this is the right mindset, but it's incomplete. Yes, Jesus will rule. Yes, Jesus will judge the nations. Yes, Jesus would establish an everlasting kingdom that would have no end. But first, he must pay a debt. First, he'd have to suffer at the hands of sinners and be crucified. First, he must taste the sting of death and become the vessel of God's wrath for all those who would believe. God the Father had already preordained the cross before the crown, condemned before commemorated, crucified before he was acclaimed, and he would be held in the Father's crucible before he entered his coronation. And this was a mindset that the, the apostles had a difficulty reconciling. Far be it. And so we find ourselves... At verse 21, it says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. They may have forgotten Isaiah's prophecy or not fully understood it. When Isaiah talks about the suffering servant, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By this knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities." Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sins of many. And so as we approach our text, we see Jesus shifting the mindset of disciples from just merely a physical kingdom of a new righteous rule and government to also a spiritual kingdom built on the back of Christ. Beginning with himself, the chief cornerstone, then with them, and now us. Let me say that again. Beginning with himself, the cornerstone, then the apostles and disciples, and now even us. This was his plan to lay the foundation. But unfortunately, some of us uh, we, when we find out what God's plan is different from our plan, we sometimes may act like Peter. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it. Lord, this shall never happen to you. And this is very similar, this statement, that he, this rebuke, this 
infamous rebuke from Jesus is pointed at Satan. It's very similar to when Jesus had gotten baptized and went out into the wilderness, and we see that he was tempted by Satan, trying to keep the Messiah from going to the cross. And so at the pinnacle, so when we find Jesus Christ now beginning to reveal, he just finished in the company of people saying, this is your confession. Yes, you're right. Yes, I am the Christ. And right after, not much long after, he began to say, the Son of Man must suffer and be killed. And three days later, rise again. One of his closest friends in his inner circle says, far be it from you. It won't happen. As if Satan was there to discourage and deter him on the spot. And so what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. And he tells him why. He says, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's, Peter. Your interest is primarily on the kingdom. Your, your interest is primarily just on getting the power and the control. Your, your interest is primarily just on what's going to happen when I decide to overthrow Rome. And the government, not on God's and his plan of salvation. And so we see this. We find Jesus and his disciples at Caesarea Philippi. And we find that many people were following him in this area. No doubt many people heard that Jesus, the Nazarene, was present. They heard of his healing. They heard of his preaching. They heard of his boldness against the religious leaders. They heard of his compassion to society's lowest individuals. They heard of his miracles. They may have even heard of the prophecies made by the Old Testament prophets testifying that he was the king. But Jesus makes a conditional statement that would test the validity of their discipleship. Verse 24. Matthew writes, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. True discipleship involves following Christ and doing his will. Wherever that path might lead you, for following Jesus means being identified with Jesus. That's a a different lesson I don't have time for, but when we say, I am identified with Christ, our union with Christ, do we also know that that means that we have been identified in the fellowship of his sufferings as well? A lot of people will, will say that when they, seek, when they seek discipleship, they want to follow him. But when the road gets tough, do they still want to follow him? A lot of people were there. I believe that, uh, that, Matt, that Mark and Luke say that there was a crowd or a multitude around. And then with the disciples, Jesus said, whosoever would come after me must deny themselves. So in the company, if you kind of look, in the company at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus summons the people to him and says, makes a statement, in the midst of the disciples, he says, if any man, whosoever, would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow after me. Luke says, pick up his cross daily. Daily. And this is a painful lesson that Peter and his disciples now had to learn. That if they were to follow Jesus, they would be following a crucified Jesus. A Jesus that would be condemned to death. Look at Jesus' words. And he said to all, he, Jesus, God's Christ, the prophecy Fulfilled, the king, the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy, the righteous branch of King David. Yeshua said to all, 
And he summoned the crowd and called into himself. He bid them and says, if anyone desires or wishes to come after me, if anyone was there that wanted to follow him. A lot of people, when you find out, and it's very similar to why a lot of people say that on Palm Sunday, it's uh, kind of like a bittersweet because we know that a lot of the people, they were applauding Jesus Christ as he was entering into the city saying, Hosanna to the son of David. But we know that in a few days, a lot of those people would be saying, crucify him. And so with this mindset, Jesus is now changing the mindset of the disciples and says, if any man were to come after me, whosoever would come after me, let him deny self. Let him deny himself with his disciples. And he said to them, and he commanded them, whosoever, a charge, if you will, a pronouncement, a declaration, That's not popular. Whosoever wishes to come after me, desires, do you long to follow after Jesus Christ? Would you follow him in the midst of persecution? Would you follow him when society turns its back on you? Do you have this this disposition that desires to press into knowing Christ, being with Christ, living like Christ? Jesus Christ all the way. If anyone wishes or desires to come after me, this is a present tense indicative and it shows right now. So what Jesus is doing is that he's showing the crowd. He's saying, he summons them together. He says, come here. I'm going to teach you guys a lesson with the disciples. If anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone desires to come after me right now, so Jesus is pushing a call to action at that moment, really showing the difference in discipleship. If you are to approach him from the position of discipleship, will you proceed forward and advance after him? Will you still come after him? The days where you get tired, when your family disowns you, When your spouse disowns you, will you still follow after him? When your friends leave you, when your children disobey you, will you still follow him? Will you still come after him? And Jesus says, let him deny. So when you look at what Jesus is saying, He gives two primary directions of what it means in discipleship at this level. He says two things. One, let him deny himself. And the second one, let him take up his cross and follow after me. And when you look at what he says and let him deny himself, that is the primary focus of what people have a hard time putting down. It's in the future It talks about in the future going to be a day when you would have to deny, you would have to put away, you'd have to refuse away from yourself as a, a division or divorce yourself from self. Discard yourself as worthless to refuse even to acknowledge yourself as your own. It's to an act of repudiation. It's the idea behind it. You guys hear the stories of the people who go on cruise boats or they go on a cruise and we find, we find out some tragic story of, of somebody who actually has been picked up and thrown overboard and there's no one going back for them. That's the idea and the mindset of to deny. If any man were to come after me, let him deny a castaway himself, himself. We live in a day of selfies. We live in a day where it's self-interest, selfishness. Self is all about self-personal agendas. And he says here, deny yourself. Deny himself. The selfishness, the self-centered man, the self-seeking, the self-indulgent, wrapped up in self. 
Having such concern and regard for one's own intentions and advantages that you take advantage of the welfare of others. We have this idea and this moniker in our mindset and today, looking out for number one, right. Looking out for self, which leads to self-love and self-worship, vanity, conceit, and self-esteem. But what did Jesus do to himself? He allowed it to be nailed onto the cross. So he went before us. He went before us and he denied himself. He denied himself of what was owed to him. Jesus Christ, he, at the time when Jesus Christ, he had the authority but he took the role of a bond servant being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And that's where it brings us where we're at right now. So the two areas when we look at discipleship, which are very unpopular in our day and age, are denying self and taking up one's cross. The cross today is looked on by the world as uh, nothing more than a symbol. I had this one coworker who, when I went to go, and she had a, she had a necklace with a chain and a, and a cross on it, and I saw that as a means for you know, potential evangelism. So I asked her, what does that cross mean to you? And she says, oh, I thought it looked cool. But what is the truth of the cross? What is Jesus asking us to do? He says, raise it up. Pick it up. Hoist your cross. The cross was something that was strenuous. It was an instrument used for the purpose of capital punishment. And the cross was usually in the shape of a T, the Roman cross, where the victim would be laid down on top of it, placing one foot on top of the other, nailing them through to the wooden plank. And likewise, outstretched hands were attached to the raised perpendicular cross beam by nails. The cross was then hoisted up by ropes with the victim attached to it, while the bottom of the cross was firmly secured into the ground. It was a unique engineering device to hold the body weight of its pierced victim for days until they suffocated. The stretching out of the victim's arms were purposely held in place, usually by ropes and nails, in order to limit the lungs' ability to exhale carbon monoxide that would begin building up in the chest. It would slowly suffocate as if to strangle the, strangle the victim from the inside. This would cause multiple spasms throughout the muscle and the nervous system. This would cause the victim to push up from their spasming thighs and calves through the nail-pierced hands and feet in order to get the next breath of air. Every lift prevented the lungs to take in less oxygen than the previous lift. So this constant moving up and down on a cross was engineered to torture the body. Literally, the victim would have to choose between the agonizing pain of pushing their body weight up on the nails through their hands and their feet or the effects of the CO2 build up in their chest that would cause the body to experience pain as if a hundred needles were stabbing the body's nervous system. The swelled and torn lacerated tendons and the nerves from the nails would cause excruciating agony. The arteries from the head and the stomach were surcharged with the blood and throbbing headaches would induce. The mind was confused and filled with anxiety. The victim of crucifixion literally died a thousand deaths. This would last for days until the body expired through cardiac arrest or the lungs being filled with bodily fluids, and then it would collapse. Executioners sometimes would have mercy on victims and would speed up the dying process by taking a hammer and breaking their legs. The cross was seen as a symbol of shame and permanence. With few and limited exceptions, Roman citizens were not permitted to be crucified as if to show that this was a form of execution that was beneath even the most heinous criminals in the Roman Empire. 
The cross was reserved for the lowest of the low, slaves, criminals, and thieves. And Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow after me. But what does the cross mean spiritually? We need to address this. What does the cross mean spiritually? It was the instrument that God the Father predetermined to use as a vehicle to pour out his wrath on the Son of Man. It was used as the altar by which the Lamb of God would be sacrificed and bear the curse of sinful men, women, and children. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and when he created Adam, man sinned. Ever since then, there has been a gulf, a chasm separating a holy and awesome God from his sinful and rebellious creatures. Man had no hope of avoiding or sidestepping the righteous wrath of God, and so when we find that God had pity on mankind, he had to send a mediator. I like how John Stott puts it. He says, man in his sinful self, in his sinful state, John Stott says, not only does he not possess the mental equipment to conceive of God, but he also lacks the moral integrity to even approach him. Therefore, God must send a mediator, a God-man, that would have to die on a cross. It is this cross that Jesus says, will you follow me? Will you follow me? The cross is that suffering which results from our faithful connection with Christ and the intimation that each disciple will have his share of suffering. And when we kind of look at what the cross did, when Rome, the way they did it, the cross they had the criminals carry, they had to carry the very instrument publicly because their display of public rebellion and was only fitted for the, the level of humiliation that they would have to submit to the Roman authority. When a criminal was to carry his cross publicly, it became a public display of not only humility, but also submission to the very authority that criminally, the criminal openly rebelled against. Are there any sinners today? Luke adds, take up your cross daily. This is a daily process, a progressive and continuous crucifixion of one's natural self-centeredness. This involves sharing the humiliation with Christ that we may also share in his glory when his kingdom comes into its fullness. When Jesus commanded his disciples to take up their cross, this was not a suggestion, but rather an imperative of permanence. This was to be a perpetual attitude in the life of his disciples. Will you pick it up? Will you carry your cross? If any man wishes and desires to come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and then follow after me. In the life of the believer, crucifixion would find you one way or the other, either on your back or on your heart. Paul says to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who am alive, but Christ who's living through me. Being crucified with Christ is no longer I who am alive, but Christ living through me. The cross means obedience as revealed in his word, accepting the consequences without reservation for Jesus' sake and the sake of the gospel. And so when we look at the crucifixion in Jesus, when he says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires still to come after me, he must, he must deny himself he must take up his cross and follow after me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. His disciples were to have the same attitude of death and life that he had. 
Are you willing to crucify your plans? Beloved, are you willing to crucify your dreams for the sake of the gospel? To follow after him? To limit yourself for what society has say are the best things in life? I'll tell you that when we look at why and how, how can we do this? Is this daunting? The answer is no. Why? Paul tells us because the love of Christ controls us. Because of love. Jesus had perfect love for the Father and the will of the Father. Even in the garden, even in the garden, he says, might this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. One of my favorite lines in the gospel narratives is when Jesus gets up and he goes and calls his sleeping disciples and he says, come, let us go from here. The issue had been resolved and he was going to go to Calvary. And Paul reminds us that it's the love of Christ that controls us. Jesus went before us. So how can we do this? It's a, it's a good thing to remember that Jesus wasn't one who set a standard that he himself was not willing to fall through with. Jesus went to Calvary and suffered between two criminals, was scourged and beaten, placed a thorn of crown, a crown of thorns on his head, on his brow, and he died a criminal's death. And even then, being the object of wrath, the vessel of wrath that God would use to justify the many, through one act of obedience, by Jesus Christ, God has made both just and the justifier. I want to read to you a portion from this book. It says, on the morning of July 27th, 1945, in the post-war devastated city of Berlin, Germany, an aged German couple sat listening to a daily radio broadcast from London. They soon realized that a memorial service was in progress. Their anxiety rose as they listened to a single German voice speaking in English. We are gathered here in the presence of God to make thankful remembrance of the life and work of his servant who gave his life and faith of obedience to his holy word. The German father clutched the hand of the German mother and they wept quietly for they knew that the person that they was being speaking of was their son, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It's the love of Christ that controls us. And God enables you to lift the load you may feel you're not able to lift. To pick up a cross that it may feel like the splinters of the cross are piercing your shoulder blades. He went before us. I'll close with the lyrics from the song by, written by Isaac Watts. Dear Isaac writes, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. 
see from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's go before the Lord. Father, as we think about the things that Jesus taught his disciples, the cost of discipleship, may we be ever so mindful as we walk towards this week thinking about the one who had went before us. And even now, as we partake of the Lord's table, let us be mindful that we too have a cross to bear. And God, we ask that even here in Colorado, God, we pray for revival. May us be mindful of your will and your plan. For in it, we know that you will be pleased. We thank you for these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.